Hey, welcome back to the Group Project Podcast. This is episode number 64. I am here with Mike Johnson. Mike is the owner and financial planner at Teacher Wealth, uh, located in Des Moines, Iowa. Hey, Mike, welcome. Thanks for being here today. Thank you. It's, uh, it's good to be here and, and uh, get to know you a little bit. Yeah, so I've talked to you before the show, Mike. You know, this show, is, we focus on kind of where leadership, education, and personal growth, where that kind of comes together, kind of that merge of those three areas. And, you know, I have heard about you for a few years now. Um, you've kind of got this niche business started where you're, you are... Um, you are working with financial planning with focused on educators, focused on teachers, educators. Um, and, uh, you know, we're going to get into your background here in a little bit, but prior to going into financial planning, you were actually a teacher. And so you've got that unique perspective of, uh, of being an educator. So, um, you know, I might just start off, I I'm speaking a lot here. I might start off, just tell us about this unique journey that you've been on. And then I'm excited to just dig in and ask you a bunch of questions about, uh, about retirement, investing, financial planning, and all that. So why don't you go ahead and just kind of tell us about this unique professional path that you've taken. Okay. Sounds great. So yeah, I, um, I guess I can start real early and just say that I was, uh, uh, a son of a teacher and my, my, um, my mom was a long time, 30 plus year teacher. She's still subbing. Actually, she, she says the last couple of years that it's going to be her last year subbing, but I don't believe her. Um, <laughs> and uh, I always grew up not wanting to be a teacher. I always said that. Um, I think a lot of people in high school told me I'd be a good teacher. Uh, but nah, my, wife, my, my, uh, my mom's that. So I don't know why I have a bad, bad rap of that. Then I got to college, kind of went into pre-business and uh, then the, someday just kind of woke up, said, let me, I would do want to be a teacher. And so <laughs> I, I applied for the education, uh, college education, university of Iowa. And they, um, they called me back and they said, we can't, you know, process your application because you haven't declared a major at that point. I was just kind of open major and I'm like, uh, Oh, okay. <laughs> How about history? And, and so that was kind of the start of it. And, um, I've always kind of had a lot of interests. I was, um, involved in a business fraternity. Uh, so kind of had this business stuff going on too, and um, graduated from the U University of Iowa, um, did my student teaching in Des Moines, and then went to New York City um, for a, um, a year-long volunteer um, thing where I lived it with uh, six other people in Brooklyn, New York, and worked at a group home for boys, and that was a great experience. Wow. Um, I suppose the, the, the story, part of that story that, that's part of my journey is um, I didn't have a lot of money. So, you know, we were on a stipend in New York City expensive. And oh, I spent a lot of time in the library reading books and um, just walking around New York City was, was good enough for me from Iowa and um, read a book about finance for the first time. And, and it kind of changed my, my world and changed my life and kind of like, oh, I, I didn't know anything about this stuff. And um, here's what I'm, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to start saving and, and all this stuff. And, and I kind of got this glimmer in my head that maybe I want to help people with their finances, like share, share this, what I've knowledge that I've learned. Um, so then I came back from New York um, and the school year had already started, so I couldn't get a teaching job. And so I actually went and applied for um, financial advising jobs. So I had three interviews and um, they had, Interestingly, they had me take um, a like a personality test to see <laughs> how I would fit in, and and I apparently I basically I failed it miserably. Oh, uh, they, they they basically told me I I didn't like I, I wasn't motivated with money um, yeah, enough to be successful at the job, and um, I was really offended at the time, but for sure that was the right move. You know, it, things have changed or are starting to change, but you know back then it was more of a sales type job and you know i'd be this young kid trying to talk to retirees or close to retirees to try to you know have them invest their money with whatever company i'm going to work for so you know it would be like a sales job and that's not why i would want to be in it you know it's all about education to me so 
then all of a sudden I got a call from my, um, from my old neighbor and said that, Hey, the, the, um, the school of Sally's Polk needs a, needs a long-term sub because they had a teacher that, um, they had just hired and after two days stopped showing up. So, um, so I kind of fell into that and it turned into a 17 year career <laughs> at, huh. uh, at, at Sally's Polk. It happened to be where my, my mom taught all those years. Oh, so okay. Taught in, she taught in the elementary school and, okay. and I taught in the, in the high school. And there was a couple years there at the beginning of my career where um, a few students had her as a kindergarten teacher and had me as a senior here. And so kind of <laughs> bookend to their career. So, uh-huh. so yeah, so then um, I, I fell into kind of t- teaching social studies uh, and after a couple of years got moved to economics um, and we had, I think we were a little ahead of the time. We we had economics for years that was required as as a course for graduation, and so I I started teaching economics and taught every every high school senior um, for many years. And at that point, after that book, I had read a lot a lot of financial planning or you know financial books. Um, and so then I kind of before it was cool to do so and required to do so, I taught a lot of. Uh, financial literacy and personal finance in that economics class, um, and so I'm still very passionate about you know K through 12 financial literacy, and I'm on some boards and on the state level, and um, so so yeah, so that so that kind of sparked you know teaching personal finance, uh, and then one of the you know I still had this glimmer maybe one helps help adults, found the certified financial planning program, started working towards that not really having any idea what it would lead to, just kind of trusting that it would all kind of work out. And got it connected with somebody who, um, once I got my test done and, and um, that he was willing to take me on as a part-time financial planner at his firm and let me kind of do it the way I wanted to do it. And um, so I did that part-time, was full-time teacher and part-time financial planner for about four and a half years. Uh, he finally talked me out of, you know, talked me into, leaving teaching which I reluctantly did it took me a long time to get to that point um, I still love teaching especially the fact that I was teaching high school seniors um, you know personal finance very important you know, mission of mine and um, and so yeah for, for two years I worked at his firm full-time and then the pandemic hit and all of a sudden you know I have four kids and we're running all over the place and all of a sudden the um, the activities dried up and I would work at home and then I didn't ha- I had had time in the evenings and I kind of just let myself ask myself you know what, what would it look like if I started my own firm because um, it was really difficult to kind of focus on teachers or try to focus on teachers but the firm that I worked for was more of a general you mm-hmm. know they work with with anybody so um, I, I kind of believe in the niche pro- pro- um, you know the niche idea and, and the power of that and so then since yeah figured out i can do it and went full throttle and my firm teacher wealth opened up um on june 26th so exciting yeah so you mentioned okay so very cool history there i there's there's a few different directions i can go here you know we do have a book question later in the show but i think i got it you left me hanging a little bit what was that book you you, you mentioned it in, in in the in the interview here you you mentioned it pre show you've got it on your um on your website as well which was kind of fun to read what book what one book kind of just opened your eyes, got you excited about personal finance? Yeah, it's, it's called The Truth About Money. Uh, at that point, it was kind of the, the, the general financial literacy book, um, kind of A through Z. Uh, it's probably 500 pages by Rick Edelman. Uh, people might have heard of him. He's, he has a radio show. Um, and you know he's written many many books but yeah that was kind of his original i don't know how many um times that's been redone um how many volumes it's 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 gotten through but uh so yeah that's still around i I think i read the original though okay um so let's so you mentioned where you worked for those couple years was more general and now you wanted to do something that was 
more geared towards teachers. How does that look different? You know, a lot of people listening, uh, we've, we've got, you know, our audience, I mentioned before the show, mostly educational leaders, aspiring leaders, you know, they might already have a, who, it, who they would recall or call a financial planner already, or maybe they're thinking about getting one. What is what you offer? How does that look a little bit different than a general financial planner? Yeah, and I'd say, you know, some ways it's the same, some ways it's different. It's, it's um, the first thing is, you know, are, are people doing real financial planning? And so um, not everybody does that. You know, somebody, some people call themselves financial planners, but don't do what I would call real financial planning. Um, but then just the idea that I work with, with teachers and educators, um, it kind of brings it to a whole nother level. Um, so financial planning, you're bringing people through a process. Uh, you're looking at not just investing, but you know all aspects of their finances, you know taxes and estate planning and and insurance and all those things. So so that's the first thing. Um, but just you know, I guess I would kind of use the analogy. Um, so I was an economics teacher, and for many many years, and I got good at my craft. Um, that first year I taught economics was not pretty, <laughs> and um, you know. Teaching, good teaching is good teaching, just like good financial planning is good financial planning. So, you know, if, if, if my school district needed me to teach like a health class for a semester, I could do it. I could be effective, but um, I'm going to make a lot of mistakes. I'm not going to be efficient. You know, that, that fourth year of teaching health, um, I'd be a pretty good health teacher, but that first year might not. So, you know, if you are, if you have a, a firm that, that has, you know, dentists here and a teacher here and and you know it's all good financial planning but the advantage of going to somebody that works just primarily with that industry means that they've seen you know things over and over and over again you know things that are going to come up and they know you know for example i know ipers you know inside and out maybe more compared to the, to the other um the planners out there that that don't work with a lot of teachers you know and so they could figure it out you know just like i can i figured it out but it's going to take them more time and be less efficient. So I think that's kind of the difference. Okay. I've got kind of a broad question here. I get, I, I uh, sent you some questions. Usually I try to send them the, uh, at least a night ahead of time. I got, I didn't have a chance last night and got into you late today, but could you maybe, I know this is a very broad question, maybe just take us through the different investment options um, that, educators have like what are the most traditional or most offered investment options that 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 educators might see yeah so it starts with um at least for public school teachers it starts with a traditional pension plan um usually that's a state pension plan um you know like you know we have ipers here in the state of iowa so uh pretty pretty cool thing uh, a lot of teachers I try to get across, you probably don't even realize how how fortunate you are um, with this thing. So, uh, you know, this is kind of what it, you know, the corporate America used to have, you know, 25, 30 years ago, and you, you didn't have to know anything. So your your retirement was kind of done for you. Money was taken out of your check. It was invested. And then there's this formula at the end where you get a check for the rest of your life. And um, so one of the number one, if not the number one concerns of retired people is that, am I going to run out of money? And the last thing you want to do is live on social security. Um, and so by having that pension plus social security, you're going to have, you know, basic needs met is the idea for the most part. And so, um, yeah, that's a big deal. And a lot of people don't even realize the, the value of that. Um, you know, they might, you know, just cause they don't know, like what, what I always tell people, what, what would it take in a comparison to, to somebody that's, that doesn't have that state pension plan? What would they need in a 401k, for example? I think a, a good apples to apples comparison is, okay, I retire at whatever age. And then, um, you know, I, I can go to an insurance company and take that lump sum and go buy a stream of income in an annuity for the rest of my life, just like, you know, your state pension plan. And, you know, most states, if you do the, if you do the present value math on it, you know, that, that, um, 
that stream of income, it's going to take a 401k to have like 700,000 to a million dollars or more, uh, depend on, on the state. So, uh, for a 30 year career. And so, you know, I would say if you have $700,000 in your 401k, you're doing pretty well. Um, and that's the equivalent. So, you know, people are fortunate. Uh, oftentimes they don't realize how fortunate, um, now, if you're a private uh, teacher, that goes out the window. Like you, you know, you're not, you don't have that uh, the backstop. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's very it's much more important that you're starting earlier, just like everybody else. Um, I guess the the other message I try to get to teachers is that yes, it's great, but it's probably not enough either. Um, and the main thing is for that is just that it's 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 not inflation adjusted. So. Unlike Social Security, where you know costs go, are going to go up, there's going to be a, a cost of living adjustment on that Social Security check. Um, your IPERS or or whatever state pension plan, whatever you you get that first check is going to be you know the same 30 years from now, and you know it's it's the purchase power is going to go down probably every every month. And um, if you do the math, it it, it can be you know, considerable in, in 10 years, the drop, um, in your pay cut, if you will. So, uh, you got to fill that inflation gap at the very least, if you don't want your standard mm -hmm. to go down. So, um, you know, most, uh, most teachers have the ability to have a 403B, uh, or a 457, depending on the state in Iowa, it's mainly a 403B. Um, and every state's different. You know, Iowa has a kind of unique plan where the state of Iowa kind of controls, uh, teachers are known across the nation to be taken advantage of mm. by, um, by, you know, people sitting in the teacher's lounge and saying, Hey, do you need a, you need a 403B, which is true. And so then they put them in these, these products that, um, that they're paying like three and a half percent, uh, fees and, um, kind of really taken advantage of Iowa. I don't know if got their, I don't know if, if they're ahead of the time or what, but they, they've, they've kind of centralized it and the fees are much lower. You, you have to go through you know, a certain amount of, of providers. Um, so that's the good news. The bad news is frankly, there's a unintended effect. There's really no money for people like me to, to make on four or three Bs. And so people stop selling them. And so you have a, a, a whole group of, of a generation of teachers who maybe have started when they were 25 or 35, they started their four through B. Um, you know, maybe they're they're doing $300 a month or whatever. And then they, when they changed the plan, they had to all switch. And you know, procrastination the way it is, many of them, uh, you know, stop putting money in over here through their their personal advisor, and then never started over here. Now, if you think like just say 10 years of that of $300 a month. Um, invested in the stock market which has done pretty well over the last 10 years um it's it's a it's a it's a big number that uh just that procrastination thing got in the way and so that's kind of an unintended effect i don't think school districts do a good job at least in iowa to really push that program or even help teachers understand it i know as a teacher i would get an email once a year and you know i noticed it because i was a financial planner <laughs> mm -hmm. maybe i wouldn't have noticed it at all if i was um it was not one. So, and, and now they have, they offer Roth. Most, most school districts offer a Roth 403B, which is a whole other, you know, good thing. So, um, and then, you know, you have your basic, you know, your Roth IRAs and things like that. So um, the kind of the rule of thumb that I always tell people is just in general, whether you're a teacher or not, you start with your employer plan. Um, you know, so you know, whether you have a pension or not, you start with your employer plan. So that's a 401k or a 403b. And, and if, the, if the company matches, then you take advantage of that match. So if they match 4%, then you're putting 4% in, no brainer. Um, hopefully you get to 15%. So, um, so if you're at 4%, you want to get more, you go to the Roth IRA because um, the taxes the tax benefit on that is, is just great. There's a lot of great advantages to the Roth IRA. Um, max that out, which you can do 6,000 or 7,000 if you're 50 or older, and then go back to the, to the 401k or 403b to get to that, you know, enough, that 15% or whatever. So 
Okay. So a few questions. That was a lot. That was a lot, I know. Well, I, you, you know, I, I've read enough, thought about this enough. I could follow you. I'm going to ask you a couple of follow-up questions here. So you met, okay, let's talk about the 15%. So that's, you've already got the IPERS going, which really, if you look at the employer contribution plus the empl employee contribution, which is 15%, right? Roughly. So you're saying an additional 15% should be dumped in through a combination of 403b Roth IRA. Is that kind of what you're saying there? Yeah. So it, it, there's a lot of ways to look at it and there might be disagreement, but here's, here's how I look at it. So when you say that, you know, you, you put in 6.29% in your IPERS, um, which again, wasn't a choice of, for you. It's no, done. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and then they put in not, you know, again, it's not a choice for the employer either, but the school districts put in nine point whatever. So it's over 15%. Um, it's really not the same as, as putting 15% in a, in a 401k or 403b because it's all based on a formula. So the reason those numbers are what they are is because the state of Iowa has to make sure that their, their pension plan is funded enough to deal with all these people that are going to take a stream of income um, for many years. And we've already talked about, you know, how many dollars that can, can turn into B. Um, so they've got to have enough coming in. Uh, so the way I do it with my clients is I say, okay, you put in about 6% into your IPERS. So I count 6% for IPERS uh, as part of that 15%. Okay. Okay. And I, and I even count like, you know, a match. So, you know, if you're putting in, you know, 2% and in, in your company matches, that'd be 4%. So. Okay. Okay, I appreciate you clearing that, finding that for me. So, so really it's an extra 9% if you can think of it that way. Got it. Yep, that makes sense. So, okay, so where do you, you know, you mentioned IPERS is something that's done through the district. 403B is usually done through the district. The Roth is an option in the district. Where do you come into play at then? You, you know, like what are you able to offer? Because you mentioned here in Iowa at least, and maybe not in other states, but here in Iowa, you got to go through the 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 state approved programs uh, companies, correct? So, where where does your kind of uh, where do you come into play at there? Yeah, so it's comprehensive advice, and so you know, um, even if you do all those things on the investment side, you know, are you getting, are you making sure you have enough, uh, you know, insurance? Um, are you making sure that you know you your taxes are are on point. And I, I don't do taxes, but I, but I look at everybody's tax return and, and every financial decision usually has a tax consequence or, um, you know, a stake in, in, in your taxes that you're going to have to pay either today or, or down the line. So even whether you choose, you know, a, a traditional 403B or a Roth 403B is going to have a tax consequence. Um, and so you, you know, I feel to do real financial planning, I've got to know, you know, the whole financial picture of a, of a client. Mm -hmm. And so getting all that information um, and, and re really a lot of the value comes from combining a spouse uh, who may, may oh, not yeah. be a teacher, you know? So, um, you know, if you have a pension plan um, that again is equivalent of a, a large dollar amount at retirement, you know, how, how should you invest the other money? How should you invest your 403B and your Roth IRA? Uh, how should your spouse, if they're not, if they don't have the, the traditional pension, how should they invest their money? Well, if you think of your IPERS or state pension plan um, as a guaranteed stream of income, which it is, uh, that's bond. That's like, like a bond, right? It's, so it's, it's less, um, you know, it's more conservative, less volatile. It's a, it's a stream of income. So that's just like a bond. And so if you treat that value as a bond, you could have a whole $700,000 in another 401k. Uh, you can be 100% stocks in that and still be at a 50-50 allocation. Um, and so, you know, for a lot of people, that would be not, uh, not, not aggressive enough. So I, the, the main point of that is that you can potentially be a lot more aggressive with your other monies if you have this backstop called IPERS uh, or the state pension plan. So let's talk about that aggressiveness for a minute. Um, you know, when, when people are selecting their, it, 
at least, okay. So when I look at, and I haven't done a 403B for a little while, I've been focusing more on the Roth side, which we don't have it through our district. So I've had to go outside the district. But when I'm looking at my 403B and it, sometimes it's up to the employee to determine like how I allocate, you know, uh, uh, my funds. <laughs> and it gives you like, well, I, you can do uh, aggressive stocks. You can do moderate stock. You can do bonds. You can do... What rule of thumb, I love how you used that earlier. I love rule of thumbs. What, what, what rule of thumb is somebody is trying to out make their allocations 403, 403B, what, what kind of uh, recommendations do you give? Well, if I'm working with my client, I'm going to look at their entire situation. So I, a rule of thumb really isn't um, how I would do it. Um, there are some rules of thumbs out there that I can throw out there for you just you know, there's things that if people were to just do, they'd be, a, you know, wouldn't make the major mistakes. Um, and, and this is a mistake that a lot of, a lot of people do make because um, even if they're working with a, you know, a commission advisor who, you know, or they call that, per, that, that hotline or the 403B, um, they don't know your whole financial situation. And, it, and if you, if somebody asks you the question like, okay, how, how do you like risk? <laughs> well, nobody likes risk, right? So you're gonna say, well, I'm conservative. Well, they might put you in, you know, something that's a conservative investment. And, and once again, if you're young, you probably don't want to be conservative because you got lots of time in the market. Um, and whether you're comfortable with the stock market or not, I would argue you probably should be in the stock market. And then you have this whole IPERS or pension plan that, that you should be even more aggressive, you know? And so I've seen many people where they, you know, they have a 403B and, and they're very conservatively invested. They've been doing that for 20 years. And they don't I ask them, well, why are you invest in this? Like, I don't know, but that's what the person said. So, <laughs> um, you know, so there's, there's the rules of thumb, like 100 minus your age. That's how many stocks you should have. Uh, maybe 120 minus your age. Hmm. Um, you know, so if you're, um, if you're 40 and, you know, 120 minus age 40, that's 80%, 80% 80 stocks, 20% bonds. But, you know, those are rules of thumb that will kind of keep you away from doing something really mm. horrible. Um, you know, I've, I've had clients where not, not necessarily a teacher, but they've, <laughs> they've, they've saved 12% into their 401k for years, 10 years. And like, yay, good job. What's it invested in? I don't know. That's nor the normal answer. And then you look d deeper and it's like all in cash. And if you think about how much, um, how much uh, that would have been it's kind of scary to, to think about so um you know you know just e either educating yourself or or having you know somebody knowledgeable look it over mm -hmm. you know again, that's that's kind of what i do is i i'll take all these pots of money and making sure it's a it's a plan a good plan for the for the family so okay okay so We've got a lot of new, each year I, we introduce here in our district about 15 new teachers, all right? And most of them are fresh out of college. Most of them have some sort of student debt. Most of them have a car loan they're trying to pay off. What do you, what do you recommendation do you have? And that could be for older, it could be anybody really, but I'm really thinking, you know, our, our, our fresh out of college, I've got, Ten twenty thousand dollars in debt for college bills. I've got a car payment, which is three hundred dollars a month, whatever it is. Um, what would you recommend to them? Would you recommend pay off the debt? Would you start with the school debt? Would you do the car debt, or would you say, you know what, you can, you should also start contributing to to a four hundred three b or to an Roth IRA? What would you say there? It's a it's a hard. Uh, it's a hard question to answer because the question, the answer is always, it depends. And, you know, as a fee only financial planner, um, I, I really have to know the situation, but even more than that, um, the, you know, what the, what the teacher, um, what their emotional response to money is too. You know, some people um, can put it, be put on a plan to pay down debt and be successful and others really struggle with that. So, um, sometimes if they struggle with that, then just getting an automatic thing going in the Roth IRA or four, four through B is much better. Even if the math works out better to pay off that student loan. 
Um, I know I'm not giving you an answer here, but it's okay. <laughs> uh, uh, and and the student whole the student loan thing has all kind of been thrown up in the cards too, because um, you know one we have a lot of a lot of state employees are eligible for the the, the forgiveness program, um, which it's it's the best one. The public service forgiveness program is is the best uh, student loan forgiveness program out there. Um, we have a, a Biden administration who's talking about maybe forgiving your forgiving loans. Um, we don't know what that number is going to be uh, or if it's going to happen. I've, I've told some of my clients like stop paying your, you know, your student loans down because hmm. you know, you might pay for two years and then they might forgive um, where that was kind of the original plan. So it's, it's, it's hard. Uh, you really need to know the situation and, and the, the emotion and how people are going to um, handle, you know, these scenarios. Um, uh, how much you should have in a savings account is a lot to do more with your emotions and, and you know, psychology than it does with, um, you know, what's the right answer. So um, talking to people helps kind of figuring out how they tick. Um, so, you know, I would say personal finance is more personal than financial. So you really got to dig deep into the personal. Um, that's kind of where I fall on it, at least. What are your thoughts about, you know, I got a couple buddies who are big into uh, real estate, you know, flipping houses, flipping whatever it might be. What are your general thoughts on, on real estate investing? Um, so I have a couple, you know, properties myself. Um, I think it can be a great, uh, diversifier. Um, you know, you're diversifying, not just in real estate versus, you know, stocks, but, you know, a totally different type of, of investing, you know, the, you know, paper investing versus, you know, real property. Um, I think you got to always look at, is it for you? Um, and a lot of people come to me and say, Hey, you know, I'm selling my house. Should I keep this house as a, as a rental property? And then you start talking to them about, well, here's the benefits. Um, but here's what you have to do. And are you willing to be a landlord and, you know, all the things that come with that. And, you know, and when you get done talking it through, a lot of people is like, well, I don't want to do all that. So um, I think it can be a great thing if you're willing to be a small business owner on the side. Um, so. Uh, it's it, like I said, it's a great diversifier. When I was a brand new administrator, I had a a couple of gentlemen in the city. I was I was brand new to the city, and uh, I had a couple guys who were like trying to sell me life insurance. Uh, and I didn't really know what that entailed. They made it sound like it was a good investment. My dad had kind of told me to stay away. And I, I, that was just kind of what he told me. And I just kind of went with it. He said, focus on your 403B. Um, what would you say about that? What, maybe just what is life insurance and, and would you, would you recommend it? Is it, who would that make sense for and anything you can share about life insurance? Yeah. So life insurance is very important in a, in a financial plan. So, um, when it comes to, um, just getting your normal life insurance. What happens if you die? Um, you got to protect your family. That's definitely very important. Um, and, and frankly neglected for a lot of people, most people are underinsured um, if they have any insurance. And so, uh, you know, the way I look at it is you need a lot of life insurance when you have kids. And then there's some day if you do your planning right, that you don't need any life insurance. So, um, you know, I'm not a big fan of the whole life um, insurance and, and even if it, you know, you can make an argument for it, but here's the biggest problem with it is, so let's say that I, well, let's say myself, I have four kids, right? Um, and if I were to die today, you know, that would definitely put a crimp in the financial situation of my, my family. And, um, you know, they would lose this income that's going to go on for however many years. And so I need to have a, quite a bit of life, life insurance. And um, if somebody were to try to sell me whole life, um, to get the amount that I need is going to be way, way, way expensive. And I'm probably not going to um, 
be able or willing to pay that much for you know one type of insurance and so you see a lot of people who maybe need a million dollar life insurance and they only get 250,000 because they were sold whole life um, and so they're underinsured and you know so that's that's the biggest problem I see it's not even that whole life is necessarily a bad type of insurance it's just they when they really need it they can't afford to get enough and then you know most the reason why you know whole life can even exist mathematically is because most people you know get out of the policies before they even pay down you know, before death so <laughs> um so yeah i'm not a, not a big fan of whole life but you know there's there's a place for it um there's people out there who who say it's a scam and whole life is you know always the you know not the good thing to do and you know buy term and invest the difference that's the only way to go and i i, I don't i don't think that's the way the answer either there's there's definitely um reasons to have whole life okay you're doing a great job answering a lot of these questions i really appreciate it what about this is a show that's you know mostly the 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 audience is is educational leaders and there's a lot of temptation for educational leaders in any state to want to cross state lines. Um, so your pension pro, you know, the pension that you've invested in for maybe 15 years, you ha obviously haven't hit that full retirement age or whatever you want to call it. I don't know if I said that right, but, but there's a job over the, over the river in Illinois or across the border in, in Nebraska you know, what do you, what would you recommend? I know you kind of say every, you know, you've said a lot of times it depends on the situation, but how big of a hit does that hit your, your IPERS or what, or your, the pension that you've got built up through the state that you're in? Yeah. So that's kind of the downside of a traditional pension is um, if you have a, you know, 401k type plan or 403b and that's your only retirement, um, it's pretty portable, right? So you'll just move it on, you know, go from company to company to company. You know, it's not really that big a difference. But if you're gonna, if you're going to move across state lines and, and you have these pension plans part of your plan, then you got to just make sure that you know what you're getting into. And um, because the power of the pension plan formula probably is the amount of years you're under that plan. So. Um, if I'm if I'm a 30 year employee under IPERS, um, that's pretty powerful. I, I I cut it off after 17, right? Myself, and that really changed my my own retirement. And so, if you're going over state lines, even if you have another pension um, that's going to be picked up, kind of the difference, um, you kind of have to look at are, are two the same as what one would have been, and you just kind of got to kind of go through it. Um, there's some wrinkles there, like you know, if you if you go to into um, Illinois, for example, or other states that they don't pay into Social Security. So, um, you know, on on one end you're getting Social Security because credits on, in Iowa. But if you go to Illinois, all of a sudden you're that's going to hurt your Social Security number. So it's not just the pension plan either. Um, that's and that's the another reason why you should have these other you know individual type plans like a 403B or Roth IRA or whatever. So, okay. So we talked about young teachers fresh out of, you know, that example, I got some debt. Let's go on the opposite end. Let's talk about the high earners. Okay. We've got a lot of, we got a lot of superintendents who, who listen. Um, they're making, they probably make more than they probably can't even invest in a Roth IRA. They probably make too much. Um, or maybe between them and their wife, you know, their wife is also, you know, has a, has a lucrative job and, you know, so on the high end, if somebody's, if somebody's, you know, they've got their IPERS, obviously it's a given, um, they can't do the Roth. Um, they're maybe their Mac, it's a lot to say their Mac's not a four or three B. I don't know if that, that's a lot, but what would be another option on top of, uh, on top of, um, the IPERS and the 403B, like what's another uh, way to generate money? Yeah. So in that case, you know, some of the value can come just by managing taxes, you know, so if you have a high income earner, um, that's going to be, you know, pretty wealthy down the line. Um, 
taxes are going to be a, a pretty important thing. So managing your taxes in the future can pay dividends maybe more than where you invest it. Um, I also think sometimes we forget that just a normal investment account <laughs> works, right? So, you know, if you max out your Roth IRA or you max out your, your 403B, um, just invest in the old fashioned non-retirement account has its advantages, especially if you're going to retire earlier. And that's another issue that teachers have is, you know, if I'm going to retire at age 65, that's say called the, the normal retirement age. Well, you got teachers that can retire at 55, 56, 57. Um, you know, they, they got to figure out how am I going to pay for health insurance? Number one, but also um, if I have money invested in say a, 403b um you know or a roth ira i, I got to be at 59 and a half before i can start taking money out without penalty you know so having money in in a in a traditional uh, or not traditional but a, just a normal taxable um investment account can can be a good thing um you know we talk about diversification of of, of uh, investing but also diversification of these type of accounts so if you have money um in a traditional type, you know, pre-tax uh, account like a 403b that you're going to pay taxes on the way out of it, and you have a Roth bucket, and you have a just a regular taxable bucket. Now you, somebody like me, can really put together a plan of of how to withdraw in different accounts um, to save the most taxes in in future years. So having that flexibility can pay dividends. Um, by saving a ton of taxes in the future. So if somebody wanted to do, you, I, I don't know if I'm using the right terms, like a regular investment account. You've said that a couple of times. I, I don't know if, I, if regular is the right word. <laughs> um, two questions for you. Where would they go? Like, where would you recommend? Where's the first place you should go to do, uh, to do that type of investing, if I'm saying that right? And then what are the tax implications? Um, you know, how much, say I want to take that money out. You, you mentioned you could take that money out before you hit 59 or 65. Like what are the tax implications of pulling that money out? Yeah, so where to go, you know, I'm a financial planner. So um, I would go to a comprehensive financial planner and see what, where they handle their money, you know where they could, where their custodian is. I mean, you can do all this stuff on, on, a, on your own. Um, but so you can go to an E-Trade or, you know, wherever you want to go, you can go to a Vanguard if you want. Um, and, and those places are great. I, most of my, most of my investments that I put my clients in are Vanguard ETFs. So uh, it's just that um, getting the comprehensive financial planning is so valuable. Um, that's, that'd be my first stop. But ultimately, it doesn't really matter where you go if, if you're educated yourself and you feel like you have this down. Tax-wise, um, you're going to be taxed on the gains. So it's the retirement accounts. The reason why they have weird names like 401k and 403b and 457 and 412a and all that stuff, those are, those are um, places in the tax code. So 401k is the 401st section in subsection k. That's where the law states that they can give you this type of plan. And it's a tax benefit. And so just a normal taxable account is, is just a normal account that has zero tax benefits. So you put post-tax money in, you don't get any benefit. Um, if you get a dividend in that year through your mutual fund or whatever, you have to pay taxes on that money. Um, unlike in a Roth IRA where you wouldn't. Um, if you make a sale, like you know, your mutual fund sells some stocks in there and you get some capital gains, then you have to pay taxes on that year. Um, and then on the, on the way out, if you sell it, so let's say um, you put $10,000 in and, and it turns into 15,000 and you cash it all out. Well, you, you've already, you don't have to pay taxes on the 10 because that was your original basis, but you could take out your, um, you know, that $5,000 is going to be taxed. But as of right now, um, it'll probably be a lower tax uh, percentage than your what you would have to get paid or what you would have to pay for your ordinary um, income that you earn at your job. So probably 15%, maybe, maybe 20. And maybe zero, depending on your tax bracket. 
So there's a lot of moving parts. <laughs> I, could, I guess so. So I was wondering if that's where that capital gains, like that 15% came into play and, and you're, sh- yep. na- you're not in your head. Yes. Yeah, so um, I dabbled in, uh, you're going to laugh. I dabbled for a year and a half in, in Robin Hood. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I got, it, it was good to learn. Uh, I, I, I realized I don't have the, um, appetite, you, you know, the, the ups and downs of the stock market, the day trading, I don't have the, uh, my, my conscience or my, um, my anxiety gets to me a little too much. So I, I dropped out of that after a year and a half. Um, <laughs> but I was actually in on Amazon when it was like under a thousand dollars. I was, it was oh. like, I don't know what it's at now. And maybe it's at 3000. I have no idea. Uh, I was also in on Apple when it was like, and Tesla. I was in on Tesla when it was a couple hundred bucks. And now here it is. Thousand, I don't know. So anyways, <laughs> it was fun, but I'm out. And I've heard of all the things that have been going on this year with, with Robin Hood. And I'm kind of glad I'm out. So what about, hey, let's just ask that question. What if somebody says, I want to do Robin Hood or is it Acorn? Or I, I don't know what those are called. What, what would you recommend about that? Is that a good idea or not a good idea? So if a client came to me, I would say I would let them. Um, but here's the thing is like, what's your budget? So, you know, most of your money is going to be in the, in the boring old tried and true. But if you want to have a little special investment account because you like it, because you're interested in investing, um, you go right, a, right ahead. I get it. You know, I, I mean, us financial advisors kind of like that kind of thing anyway. So I, sure. I totally understand when somebody um, is interested in that and they want to learn about stocks, but nobody's good at it. I mean, I mean, I shouldn't say nobody, most 99.5% of people, including the experts, you know, are not good at it. <laughs> um, yeah. And so, so, you know, what makes you think you're going to be good at it? So I, I'm not your, I don't pick stocks, you know, individual stocks for my clients. Um, mm-hmm. Cause it's, it's a loser game. I spend my time on learning all the tax rules and learning uh, all the financial planning stuff on all the other stuff that, is in a person's life. And, and that includes just making sure that people are, how to talk to people, how to ask questions, how to get, you know, husband and wife to talk to each other and put together some systems um, around their money. And um, yeah. And, and, and be the accountability partner to actually get some of these things done. You know how many people, you know, say that, boy, we should get a will this year and they don't. So you know, that's, 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 it's usually the things we know. Like I, when I was a student, when I was a teacher, I was I always made this example. Like my students know that you shouldn't get credit cards when they walk in my door, right? They're, they're a junior or senior high school. They understand that. So we talk about debt and all this stuff, but that doesn't mean that they're not going to go out in the real world and not accumulate debt. There's other things out there that cause us to do these things behaviorally. Right. And so putting systems in place and getting these things like, you know, hey, I'm putting $250 a month in my Roth IRA, my first year teaching, and I'm just going to keep doing that and I'm going to get increased that every year. You know, those are the kind of things that make a difference. Um, you know, getting the money out of your hands before you guys have, are able to spend it. And that's what makes these, you know, these apps like Robinhood, which I think ultimately are a good thing, but because it's easy and it, and it feels like a video game people are going to struggle at some point when the market doesn't just keep mm-hmm. going up and it will someday. Mm-hmm. And now we'll, then we'll start to hear, you know, the, you know, the sad stories and then we'll, there'll be a backlash. And, but I think ultimately, you know, having people have access to information in the markets is usually a good thing. So. Well, I've taken the first 50 minutes just asking all my questions. That I'm just curious about, it's been a lot of fun listening uh, we're going to have to move on to the uh, kind of the quick hitter um, other questions that we have here. But before I transition, are you currently taking new clients? Yes. So, you know, I just, just started this gig. So, um, you know, I'm uh, right on track uh, getting new clients in the door every month. Um, so, uh, but yes, definitely taking new clients. So what would be the best way for someone who's listening? Cause I have been really impressed. I, um, with the way you've been able to explain complicated topics in a way that makes sense to me as an educator, I think it's been 
outstanding. What's the best way for people to get a hold of you? Yeah, so you can just go to, you know, email me, Mike Johnson at teacherwealth.com or go to my website, teacherwealth.com, and there's a button on there that has a, uh, an, you know, my calendar that you can just set up a, a Zoom call or a phone call and, and we can talk. Okay. Okay. All right, man. Hey, I'm just, if you're joining us late, um, this is episode number 64. I'm meeting with Mike Johnson, who is the owner of Teacher Wealth, located in Des Moines, Iowa. He works exclusively with educators. He is also a former high school economics teacher uh, here in the state. Uh, all right, man, we're, we're going to jump into some uh, kind of some quick hitters here and just kind of learn a little bit more about you and see if there's any other uh, just tips or tricks we can take away from this conversation. So, um, all right, first question, if we are visiting Des Moines, what is one place we've got to check out? Uh, I'm going to go with the tried and true um, Capitol building. Okay. Um, so, you know, I'm a, I'm a history major. And so I've um, gone to, tried to go to many, many uh, capital buildings across the nation. So I think I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm probably only gone to like 16 or 17 or something, but hope to get to all 50. So if you haven't done that yet, I would, I would definitely hit that. So you can just do like, is there a certain time of the day? Do they have tours? I, I, I haven't actually been there. I maybe in. You haven't been there ever? No. I mean, not inside. It's sad. I, I've, I've done many a jogs and, you know, around the Capitol and kind of hung out, take some pictures, but actually never inside. So that's probably, I shouldn't even mention that on the I mean, show. You can, go, but... you can go just walk around, but uh, yeah, I would get a tour. Okay. Okay. Um, what is, you know what? I was going to change this question. I'm going to do it on the fly here. Okay. It, the question used to be, what is one up to $50 purchase you've made in the last year? But I, I feel like I'm not getting the best answers on that. No offense to any of the previous guests, but I want to know what is like the best gadget, the best gadget or tool that you have. Okay. That's maybe unique and try to go with me here if you can, that makes your life easier. What's the best gadget or like, Hey, this has been slick. I would totally recommend this. That makes that question a lot easier for me, actually. Okay, um, good. Cause there's a no brainer. Um, my Apple pencil. Hmm. So if, <laughs> if you were to see my colleague teaching colleagues, uh, they would be laughing at me right now because uh, I'm not like a, you know, one of those people that always on cutting edge and technology uh -huh. and, and, you know, they always laughed at the, the phone I always had. And, um, so to one of the greatest things I did when I started my company is, is bought a iPad and the Apple pencil. And I never have paper around anymore because everything uh -huh. And so I can, I can get, um, like a PDF, uh, of something and, you know, get on there and I, on my Apple pencil, you know, take a sketch and save it. Um, it is, it is, I take all my notes on my iPad anymore. And it's, it's unlike a lot of pencil, like you, you can put your hand down on it on the, on the iPad and you can still write. So I don't know how they did that technology. I'm not a technology guy, but um, if you would have told anybody I know that I'm going to spend $99 on a pencil <laughs> a mechanical pencil and like rave about it they would say you're lying about me but that's that would be my answer okay apple pencil and you said about around a hundred dollars is that what you said yeah okay and does that work okay just just on the ipad is that fair to say like you i think so i okay. think so yeah. okay i don't think it works on my iPhone. <laughs> okay i yeah well i was wondering if you've got like a different, uh, a non Apple. I don't know if anybody, you know, non Apple, um, would it work on a non Apple? You think probably not. I don't, I, I don't think so. That's not how Apple works. <laughs> yeah. They got to keep in that ecosystem, right? <laughs> yep. Um, what is one book? Okay. You've already mentioned the truth about money. So you can't choose the truth about money. What is one book that has greatly influenced your life? Um, 
So there's this book called Columbine about the Columbine massager, massacres. Yeah. Have you, have you heard of that? Uh, I have not heard of the book. No. Okay. So I was in college when Columbine happened and, you know, watched the TV coverage, you know, for however many hours straight, you know? Yeah. Um, so then I read this book. It was done 10 years. It really was released 10 years or shortly after. I think it was a 10 year anniversary. And it was written by a, a, a reporter who was on site of Columbine. And he did like this deep dive in Columbine. And basically the moral of the story that I, at least what I took out of it is that when you see the coverage of Columbine and you have all this, you know, things that they, that they tell you that happened, like none of them's true. And there's all these myths about, you know, this or that. Um, and it, it really impacted me as far as like when, news comes out that you, it doesn't, the first time it comes out, you're not going to get the whole story and you really should be digging and be skeptical and ask questions. And mm. that book is just really cool because um, there was, um, well, number one, Columbine, just, just an interesting tidbit. Like the fact that it just happened to be in Columbine, they were one of the first schools to have cameras. And so to even even be able to do the the research and to see what the movements in the schools were um, allowed this writer and, and other people to to figure out what actually happened. Um, there was another gentleman on site, and I don't know his name, but he had a daughter um, who was in the building, and he got he learned about the news, ran over there. He was he's worked for the FBI. And so he got on the, on the, he was like a, 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 a hostage negotiator. And so he, and he um, was like one of the last people to talk to David Koresh or something like that. And, but he, he like saw everything from the police, when he, the police, their actions were opened up to him and he had this interesting perspective. And so he's interviewed um, the, I think the, the parents of the, the killers were interviewed and, um, so it just did a deep dive on things that you didn't quite get when you were first learning about the huh. Columbine situation. And, and so what, definitely an interesting read. Yeah. Well, you always hear about this, you know, fake news that we live in right now. Uh, I, I didn't know, you know, some, when was that? 94? Yeah. Uh, so 27, 28 years ago, <laughs> that, that still what we saw then was, uh, was maybe not, tr you know, what we were getting was maybe not the, the accurate information. Very cool. I like that. I'm, I sort of want to check that out. Um, I appreciate you sharing that. Uh, okay. The next question is, what is one phone app that has positively impacted your life? I could throw away my phone and live my life just fine. <laughs> uh, but Google Maps has changed my life. Okay. So, um, I'm always lost. That I don't know how I would go through life without that now. So I'm going to go uh, to the simple Google Maps. Okay. So you're kind of a minimalist when it comes to your phone then, huh? Uh, I mean, I wouldn't say that. I mean, I'm, I have the same problems as everybody else, but uh, <laughs> like, like if it didn't exist, I'd be fine. Is there any, uh, is there any special... Um, personal finance app or money, anything that you've got in your phone that you, that you would recommend? Um, I really don't, you know, I, I do have this, you heard of the budgeting system, YNAB, you need a budget. Okay. Um, so my colleagues at the firm that I was at before, they were all into that. And I finally tried it this um, starting this past summer and it's really good. So Okay. Uh, it does cost. It's not like a free version, um, but they got kind of got their own special way of doing things. And um, if you follow their system, it's it's pretty pretty good. So I assume they have a phone app. Okay. I use it, but I don't I don't use it on my phone. So what was it called again? Uh, you need a budget. You need a budget. Yep. Why nab? Why nab? Okay. Um, next question. You talked about, yeah, you talked about the job that you applied for as a financial planner, uh, and kind of how that was, that actually worked to your advantage. So, um, 
let's, let's ask about this then. The next question that follows that is a particular failure that set you up later for success or a favorite, favorite failure. So maybe besides not getting that job, is there any other favorite failure that you've had and anything that you learned from it? I would just say my first year of teaching in general, like uh-huh. um, teaching's hard. And so, you know, I, I knew that. <laughs> I think people are realizing that or, just, or had an opportunity to realize how, how um, everything that teachers do and, and the craft is being more appreciated with this pandemic because a lot of people have had to try to teach their kids and do all this stuff and only have to deal with one or two of their own kids. Um, and so that teach that first year teaching was hard. Like I, I came in as a long-term sub, um, but I failed every day and just, uh-huh. you know, it, it, because you go through that and you get better and you come out of it, like, um, uh, you know, you feel like you can do anything. Now I'm in this, now I'm, I guess I'm an entrepreneur, right? So, mm-hmm. um, you know, I'm failing every day now here too. So, but I know it's going to get better and all the things I'm not good at, I'll get better at. So that's, Kind of go back to my first year teaching it. Uh, Good to remind myself that. Sure, sure. So you mentioned being an entrepreneur, going from the classroom now to, you know, where you had a pretty strict schedule, I would say. You knew, you know, when students were there, you had to be there. Um, now you've got, now you've got a little bit more flexibility. Uh, what does your daily routine look like? It's different every day. Um, I, I wouldn't say I have like a daily routine. Um, like a lot of people, um, I think it's going to be changed once once uh, we, we can go do more networking things and things like that. But um, I tell you one thing: I don't. I no longer have a twenty-four um, minute lunch. I take my time. <laughs> uh, I don't miss that. Miss that as a teacher. So take that, uh, colleagues that sell these poke. <laughs> well, how about this then? Let's ask you this: What is your best tip for being productive? Yeah, so I'd say if I'm I'm if I struggle being productive, I I go for a walk, put a podcast on. Usually gets me thinking, um, and then come back and sit down and and go at it in in a focused way. So, you know, get in some blood pumping, um, clear your mind, get out get out of the environment, and then come back. Um, I think that's that's my biggest okay. tool that I use. I've blogged about my financial journey in terms of personal finance and my your, um, my version of the truth about money was the total money makeover with yeah. Dave Ramsey. Big, big Dave Ramsey fan. Okay. A lot of people, a lot of people in my industry don't like him, but. Yeah, just, I, I'm curious, what do they not like about him? Is it the personality or is it his, um, his philosophy um i would say it's more his philosophy so you have a certain part of the industry who doesn't like him because he's bashing things that they sell so you <laughs> know, if, if you're a seller of annuity uh, of annuities and that's kind of how you make your money and you know and he says that every annuity is bad um then they probably don't like him same with like people like whole life insurance that sell whole life insurance. So there's yeah. that, um, you know, I'm not a big fan of his investing philosophy. Um, but you know, that's not what he, that's not what he, that's not the value. I don't think he brings, mm-hmm. I think you could, you could argue that he, no, no other person, um, has done more to change people's just normal people's behavior when it comes to their personal mm-hmm. finance. Um, And ultimately, that's what makes a successful plan, especially if you don't have a ton of money. And, and, you know, again, that's what I'm passionate about working with teachers is because we're just everyday average people. Um, And the the kind of financial planning that I do, um, which is holistic, life-centered financial planning, that's been around for years for the wealthy. But, you know, teachers are ignored um, because they don't have you know, assets and Mm. in general, um, there's enough teachers that do have assets, but you know, in general, you know, if if all of my wealth is in my, in my, uh, 
or my IPRs or state pension plans. And there's not a way for maybe somebody like me to make money mm-hmm. by serving you uh, in certain models. And so th- I guess what I'm trying to, what I'm getting at is, you know, average people have to do things right. They don't have like a ton of money to save them. So, you know, if you have high income or a lot of wealth behind you, you can make mistake after mistake and still be okay. Um, so average people need to make good decisions if they're going to dig themselves in a hole and hit, get him getting his methods, getting people out of that hole is, is amazing. So, mm-hmm. and all it is, is him just sticking to his, his step plan, right? Mm-hmm. That's the value of financial planning that I do too. It's like, I just take somebody through a process and everybody's going to be different, but we're going to go through the process and make sure we cover everything. Well, Dave Ramsey says, do this first, then do this, then do this. Don't finish. Don't go on to the next thing until you're done with the next, the first step. And it makes, it just makes sense. And people follow that follow it, you know, have success. Anybody besides Dave Ramsey, if, if I'm looking, I'm always looking for new authors or new podcasters in the personal finance world. What, what, who's the, who's one other person you would, you would point me in their direction? Uh, well, I always think it's healthy. Um, I shouldn't say that word. It, it's interesting, healthy to read like, a, you know, rich dad, poor dad, Kiyosaki, um, to get that point of view. Uh, you kind of got to be careful with it. Uh, I've given that book to some students and they've kind of run wild with it. So in good, good and bad ways, uh-huh. you know, um, but that's that's healthy to kind of see the world. I think that opens up people's eyes. So I, I always recommend that book as a okay. that's going to get you thinking. One of my uh, one of my favorites has been "I Will Teach You to Be Rich." Ramit Sadie. Yeah. Oh yeah. You uh, you know he kind of like a uh, and he's pretty you know I follow him on Twitter and he's pretty outspoken against. <laughs> Sometimes against the old established, the Ramses and the, uh, you know, the older, you know, how you got to save everything. He's like, have fun. <laughs> use, use, you know, like you can have his classic line is like, it's okay to have a latte. <laughs> if you yeah, lattes yeah. get the, get the dang latte. Um, wh- just a question I have is, y- y- you know, um, just psychologically, I, this is a very broad question, but he would say, Whereas Dave would say, be gazelle intense about saving every, you know, paying off every debt. Whereas Ramit would say, buy the stuff that makes you happy. There's a lot of psychological advantage to buy. Where do you stand in there? If somebody is saying, you know what, I, I really like this. I, I tend to overspend in this area and whatever it is, just something that makes me happy. What, how do you, what would you say? Yeah, I think that's the value of um, of me getting to know the client really well, right? So kind of knowing how they tick. Um, like I said, not everybody's going to be able to just pay down debt. Um, you know, so you have to be, you have to be bought in. You have to maybe hit bottom before you're, you're ready to all, go all in. Um, and so I think the value of Ramit Sethi is that one, he's all about automation. Right. So uh, I would think that's the, the big highlight that I would take from his stuff is, um, you know, set it, set these things, these savings things, and then go spend the rest. So as long as you do this on this side, um, you know, you're automatically saving and um, you're, you're using your, your match at your 401k or whatever. Um, then, yeah, you have a, have a life. And then the second thing I think his, what he really is good at is, um, it's the big wins that matter. And so, you know, he always makes fun of that latte factor, right? So, uh, which I think there's value in the latte factor, factor, but you know, um, but yeah, if you, if, if you, um, if you don't buy too big of a house and you live within your means and buy a, a house you can easily afford, that was always my tagline when I was teaching, uh, kids is like, don't buy a house that you can afford, buy a house you can easily afford. And, you know, if that first house is purchased at that, that, you know, that mindset, then you can make some mistakes and even get in debt. And then you wake up one day and you're like, man, I got to change. I got to do better. Well, if you're in this huge house and it's 45% of your income that's going into this thing, like you come to me and I say, okay, well, 
we got a couple of choices. Like you're going to have to cut something or bring in more income. And what are you going to cut? Like your biggest, biggest expense is your house. Are you going to be willing to sell your house? Well, most people won't, right? Dave Ramsey could yell at you and say, sell your house, but most people aren't going to be able to do that emotionally. Um, and so I think the the way to do that is just not get the big house. Thing. Mm. I, I promise you, like you will, you'll get that house, right? And you'll be happier in the meantime, because you will not be, have this thing hanging over you and be deep in debt that brings a lot of anxiety to, to you. So, you know, start early with, with, with some of these, these wins and you'll be uh, in good shape. Do you have a quick rule of thumb that you follow for what percent of your paycheck should go towards your house? Um, you know, I, I like uh, 25% of your take home, um, which in some, you know, easier to do in Iowa than maybe other loca- loca- locations that, sure. that, um, that your listeners might be in. But, um, you know, two and a half times your, your income, your value of the house, two and a half times, that's pretty conservative. So. Okay. 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 Man, I just love digging into this stuff and I'm taking, I'm taking us astray here. So, Hey, is there any, we're we're at, we're at the end of the show here. I I've taken you well over an hour. Is there anything we didn't talk about you would like the audience to know? Um, well, I guess one thing, you know, I think you were going to maybe ask me what uh, was a goal I was working on. So I can, I can put those together. Um, so I, I am excited. I am working on a couple of like educational um, courses, I guess you would call them, um, for specifically for teachers to kind of go in the, so I can only have so many clients. Here's the problem, right? So, you know, I can't have 700 clients. I can have 70 clients. And so um, I'm here to really change um, how educators think about their finances. And, and, and so I, I don't want to just help somebody. Um, so I've put together some, some things that are just about to come on online. Um, cool. Some educational things. And then one, another one is, um, is through co- is for college planning. So there's the, there's this technology that I found that I, I have got access for my clients. Um, and you know, it's kind of, I think it's a game changer. Uh, the problem with college planning is that, you know, when you're trying to search for college, price is never there. I mean, we kind of just make this assumption that, you know, the vers- University of Iowa is going to be cheaper than, you know, private college uh, somewhere else in Iowa. And that's not the case because their sticker price that means absolutely nothing. It all has to do with your financial situation and what turns out on the FAFSA form. And it has to do with your, the merit aid that the college is going to pay for you. And there is no way to figure that out in a fast way. But this technology um, allows for, say, a sophomore to start searching for colleges that's going to, based on their family's financial situation, is going to be able to, um, you know, what kind of merit aid based on with my ACT and, and um, hmm. my grade point are, am I going to likely get? And which colleges in this surrounding area is going to be, you know, more cost effective? And it might not be the same ones you think it's going to be cost effective. Um, and so that's a game changer. Uh, and so I'm trying to figure out a way to to have people have access to that. You know, again, more than just my 70 clients, who mm-hmm. only a small percentage of them are going to be um, having kids in in that stage of life. So. Um, so there's some stuff coming out with that. So, so just keep, keep their eyes peeled on your website then too. Is that, is that where those, that information will be? Yep. And what's the name? What's the website again? I know you mentioned it earlier. Yep. Just teacherwealth.com. Okay. And so if somebody's from, I mentioned you before the show, probably six, two thirds of our listeners are outside the state of Iowa. One third of the, uh, of one third of the listeners around there um, are inside the state of Iowa. Um, if they're outside the state, they could still come and look at those tools. Once you get those up and running, are you, you know, would you entertain clients from outside the state? Or are you more focused on clients in the side of the state? Uh, yeah, it just depends. Um, you know, it, it's all about fit. So 
you know, there, there's, um, I, I set up my, my firm so that, you know, it, 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 a teacher and non-teacher would get value, you know, this whole idea of life-centered financial planning, which we don't really okay. go into, but, um, you know, that's, if that's, if that's what you're looking for, there might be a, a fit there, but, um, you know, most of the time I'm, I'm looking for teachers in the state of Iowa, so. Okay. Oh, and, and all educators, correct? Uh, yep. Administrators, yep. aspiring administrators, superintendents. Um, well, like I said earlier, and I truly mean this, like I think you you took a very complicated topic and made it very easy to understand. Um, I learned a lot so that I could see people who are outside the state saying, I wish I had something like this <laughs> around here because this is somebody I can talk to who understands, you know, what's going on. Um, and, in my setting, in my school district. So uh, well done. I, I appreciate the, uh, appreciate uh, spending time with me tonight. I know you've got kids, one sick kid. You said you got four kids at home and, and, and one sick and a couple are uh, with the wife, it sounds like. And yeah, I got to go pick up uh, somebody at practice and take them out of <laughs> practice. So yeah, it's, oh, it's always, you never know what's going to happen this time of day. So, well, like, like I said, this is uh, Mike Johnson, owner of Teacher Wealth uh, just kicked off kicked off uh, the uh, the Teacher Wealth um, company here uh, last summer. Uh, before that, he was uh, spent seventeen years teaching uh, high school students uh, in the Des Moines area. So, uh, if you like what you heard today, I, I really encourage you to make sure you subscribe. Uh, we love getting the reviews and the ratings. We just got another five-star review this past week. Thank you so much. Uh, like I mentioned, uh, we're really starting to take off in terms of, of the listeners. Uh, they really seem to be enjoying this content. And I don't know how you could not be impressed with what Mike shared tonight and go away a lot more knowledgeable on financial planning and some just tips about your own financial journey. So Mike, I'll let you get going. Have a good night and uh, we'll definitely be in touch. Okay. All right. Thanks. It was fun. All right. Thanks, Mike.